Eagles Entertainment. With the 15th pick in the NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast, presented by Life Brand. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and we've got a full combine recap, the National Scouting Combine, in the rearview mirror. So it is time to break it all down with Draft Buzz, where I catch up with Ben Fennel and Dane Brugler, where we talk about the players that stood out. We've had some time to let things simmer, and now that things have settled down a little bit, we can talk through who are the players walking away from Combine Week that really did the most to help their stock through the rest of the pre-draft process. We'll talk through all of that there in Draft Buzz. After that, one of my favorite exercises in On the Clock, where where Ben, Dane, and I are going to go through three random teams, three random positions, three random parts of the draft. Who are some of the, the players that fit what those three teams look for? We're going to get to that there in that segment in the middle of the show. Then we wrap things up with Draft Mailbag. We've got a handful of questions from you at home. We're going to break it all down, some Eagles-related questions uh, as well. So we'll get into that there on the back end of this show. As always, be sure to go on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify, wherever you listen. Leave us a rating, leave us a review, and subscribe. Appreciate everybody that has left us so many we got so many comments so many questions over the last few days certainly last week out in Indianapolis and we're going to get to all of them here on upcoming episodes of the show thanks so much to everybody that has done that lately and again that's the best way to reach us and the best way to throw us your support Uh, the giving season is always the case here uh, with the journey to the draft podcast that said let's get things started excited to catch up with Ben and Dane it's time for draft buzz now it's time for draft buzz all right, well, let's start things off here with Draft Buzz as I welcome in Dane Brugler and Ben Fennell. And guys, before we get into our uh, final recap of the 2022 National Scouting Combine, big news uh, on Tuesday as uh, based off reports, obviously nothing official yet until the league year, uh, the Seattle Seahawks apparently uh, on the precipice of trading quarterback Russell Wilson to the Denver Broncos, uh, a big package of players and picks heading back to Seattle, including the ninth overall pick uh, in this NFL draft. And so uh, my question for you guys is just, uh, what do you think for the Seahawks there? My, my initial thought went to Matt Corral uh, out of Ole Miss only because, uh, number one, I think you can get into like kind of uh, stylistically, I think him and Russell Wilson share some qualities, but also uh, you have the Pete Carroll, Lane Kiffin uh, connection there going back to their days at USC together. And so uh, obviously there, you know, I feel like that connection might be able to give Seattle some uh, some additional comfort, but uh, we don't know if they're going to go quarterback or if they'll go uh, some other position, maybe potentially pass rusher. Uh, obviously, they could use some help there, but uh, interested to kind of get your thoughts. Ben, I'll come to you first. Uh, when when you see that trade come across the ticker, uh, what was your mind in terms of what's, where Seattle could go with a now top 10 pick? Well, I think they're in a clear rebuild mode. mode. You know, obviously getting rid of Bobby Wagner late in the day yesterday as well. Seems like they're uh, kind of dumping off their, their cornerstone pieces over the last five, ten years. Um, unfortunate to see Tyler Lockett off of a fresh deal still sitting out there. We'll see if he's uh, available for a trade. But, you know, I look at Seattle and they have a new offensive coordinator, so they're going to have a new identity. Um, actually, an offensive coordinator was there last year in Shane Waldron. But it looks like they're just kind of turning the page and turning the leaf to, to the future. And I'm more excited for the Denver Broncos, who had a very competitive roster last year, a very good defense, despite Moving on from Von Miller and relying on a lot of young guys out there, a lot of parts on offense. They seem like they were a quarterback away from really competing in a really tough division as it is. So I'm excited for the future of the Broncos with a good roster, new head coach, new GM, kind of a new regime out there. And Seattle's kind of hit and reset. And the best way to do it, get some uh, future capital and future picks and, um, you know, start to stockpile your ideas for the future. Dane, what'd you think when you first uh, got news of it? Obviously, the threw a little bit of a thorn into your mock draft that you dropped uh, <laughs> earlier this week, but uh, interested to kind of get your thoughts on how you view Seattle here at, at number nine. Yeah, uh, your initial thought is quarterback, obviously, uh, with uh, Russell Wilson uh, leaving town. So, I, I, you know, they're all during combine week and all the different, you know, interviews and things like that. I always, the thing I always said was, I think 10, over under 10 is what where we see that first quarterback go. And that's really because Washington was picking at 11. Well, now with Seattle at nine, things get a little more interesting. And I think first off, if I'm one of those teams picking in the first eight, this is a good trade for me because this no doubt. this increases the, the likelihood of a possible trade of a team trying to get in front of Seattle to get that quarterback, whether that's Washington 
Washington, whether that's New Orleans or Pittsburgh, whoever. So if I'm a team picking in top eight, like the Giants or Atlanta or one, you know, one of those teams, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Uh, you know, at least, you know, keep the, the phone lines open and there's a better chance now than there was a couple of days ago of, of a trade happening. Uh, and then when you look at Seattle, I think it's quarterback was where, you know, the, the, my mind initially went. But I mean, look at the roster, guys. It, you, they need help. So many spots. I mean, Dwayne Brown's a, a free agent. They, they have no tackles. They need a, a tackle in a big way. So Charles Cross, Trevor Penning, or one of those two guys uh, available at nine, uh, they could use a pass rusher. So Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, Jermaine Johnson's a possibility. Uh, obviously, with Bobby Wagner out, out of the door now, too. Uh, you know, we're look at maybe uh, Devin Lloyd from Utah as a possibility. They could use corner help. So Derek Stingley uh, possibly in the mix. So quarterback is where i think that's that's where we're going to see the most you know uh attention with the seahawks at number nine but they could go really in a lot of different directions as they try to rebuild this roster all right well let's uh now shift our attention towards the scouting combine which came to a close on sunday evening and for uh, everybody out there who maybe didn't listen to our daily recaps obviously we covered all of these positions all of these players uh, from soup to nuts. I mean, really, really in-depth stuff from you guys uh, joining on a daily basis out in Indianapolis. So uh, we were able to cover every one of those. We're going to kind of go uh, just all encompassing throughout the course of this event and some of our big takeaways. Uh, ben, I'll come to you first. Which position group do you feel was most impressive? Not necessarily which day, but just overall, which position group? Did you just walk away saying like, man, this, this group was just really impressive overall? Well, I'd go with that second group of defensive linemen, which really encompassed a lot of the edge rushers out there. And I think it was just really exciting to watch them go and just, you know, kind of a bang, bang, bang order and drills and watch the 40, you know, whether it's guys like Amari Barno blazing in the four threes and, you know, guys like Sam Williams and Boye Mafe and uh, Ojabo and Jermaine Johnson. And I know a lot of those guys weren't just in that group, but the edge rushers collectively just freak shows at all different height, weight, speeds, abilities, skill sets. I think it's just a really fun group. It's a deep group. It's top heavy. It's deep through the middle, a lot of depth on the back end. There's a lot of guys you don't even get to conversationally just because that front end is so deep with a lot of big names. So edge rushers, defensive ends, the quarterback hunters, uh, as we like to say, this draft is plenty full of them. And I thought at Indy, they really showed out on the field uh, in their shorts and T-shirts. Yeah, I mean, coming in, everybody knew that that was the A-plus group in this draft. You had the, the top-end talent. You had the depth throughout, uh, and they carried that through. Uh, I thought that those those guys really, really stood out out in Indianapolis. I would say the same about this linebacking group. Obviously, that happened in the, the group immediately following those pass rushers. But when you look at the way that those guys went out, not only tested, but also just performed in position workouts, I, I was really impressed. You go to uh, Troy Anderson from Montana State, Christian Harris, Alabama, Tevin, Devin Lloyd, uh, Damone Clark, Chad Muma. Uh, you know, Malcolm Rodriguez tested really well uh, before the positional workout ended. You just go down the list. I just felt there were so many guys uh, that had some hype coming in, matched that hype. Uh, you know, one of the best players in the group, Nicobe Dean, didn't work out. But I think outside of that, all of these guys really, really showed up well. So I was impressed with the linebacker group. Uh, Dane, how about you? Is there a position that, that really stood out the most to you uh, as the weekend came to a close? Yeah, I, I think that uh... – uh, as much fun as we had Saturday night, which which was a blast with those, you know, the, the groups that you guys just talked about. I thought Sunday with the corners was, was fun as well. Uh, we had 10 players, 10 corners run in a four twos or four threes, uh, which is crazy, uh, including Kalen Barnes, who ran the four two three close to John Ross's record. Tariq uh, Woolen with a four two six. Zion McCollum. I, I know we'll, we'll talk about him more as this uh, pod goes on because his, his he had an all-timer uh, of a combine performance across the board. Um, and, it, and even the guys that didn't run four twos, four threes, guys like uh, Sauce Gardner running a four four one. Um, I don't know that we really expected that out of him. Um, so across the board, I thought these corners, they ran fast. Uh, they performed well, I thought, during drills. Um, I, I thought the corners was uh, overall a pretty good group. All right, well, let's get to some individual performances, and we'll go back. Uh, obviously, the three of us there just hit three defensive positions, but let's go over to the offensive side of the football just simple question. Which player helped themselves the most on offense with the way that they worked out? Ben, I'll come to you first. Well, I feel like the offseason, I put a lot of emphasis on the FCS guys, the group of five guys, what I call the process guys. And two guys, Pierre Strong, running back, South Dakota State, and receiver Christian Watson out of North Dakota State. I thought they showed up to the Senior Bowl in Mobile, checked all the boxes I wanted to see. I kept a strong eye on them. 
And then at the combine, I thought they both had outstanding workouts, not only in a linear fashion, looking explosive, but in their drill work as well. Pierre Strong running in the four threes, Christian Watson, his jumps, his times, his catching the football, his fluidity, his size at doing all that as well. So two guys, you know, it's a little bit of low hanging fruit to pay attention to those FCS guys once you get them around the power five kids, but you want to see if they look the part. Their tape checked every box. I want to move to the next phase. I want to see them against some higher level competition. Did that in Mobile. Now I want to see how it all stacks up, you know, testing and metric wise against the, the cream of the crop of this draft. And guys, they look the part out there. So let's take away that FCS label because Pierre Strong, Christian Watson are good all around prospects. And Christian Watson in my top 50, figuring out where I want to put Pierre Strong right now, who I think is just a tier behind that first wave of maybe five, six running backs. I love that. It's me like one of my favorite parts about the combine kind of coming to a close is that in part, especially for a lot of prospects, it really kind of shuts the door on oh, this was the last piece that uh, we needed to see from these guys in order to, to kind of put together the whole profile. And so when I look at Brees Hall, the running back from Iowa State, uh, we knew, like, okay, coming in, this guy's got good size at 5'11", just around 220 pounds. Uh, he's proven to be a workhorse back. He had success as a true freshman in 2019. He's a freshman All-American, and he's been a first-team All-American each of the past two seasons. Dope Walker finalist, you know, Big 12 offense player. You can go down the list of accolades there for Brees Hall. Then you see, you know, all right, let's go to the tape. Let's look at some of the metrics. Uh, he had an extremely high more, uh, missed f- uh, tackle forced rate from uh, PFF in terms of his ability to make people miss. All right, well, that's one of the more one of the more attractive qualities for the running back position. Again, talked about the ability to, to handle a full workload. He protected the football, only four fumbles in 800 career touches. Nope. Okay, okay, let's get to the next step. Is he a dynamic athlete? Is he a guy uh, that is going to wow you from that sense? Well, at nearly 220 pounds, he runs 439. He jumps out of the gym 126 inches in the broad, 40 inches in the vert. And to me, like saying, all right, Brees Hall, a guy that you know, was this was the final question he kind of had to answer. This was a, a big weekend for him. So I, I look at Brees Hall as a guy, uh, the running back from Ohio, from Iowa State, uh, really went out and showed up uh, on the turf in Lucas Oil Stadium. I don't have any sense of how he interviewed Dane. Obviously, that's going to be big. All, like everybody else, he went through medical checks. We'll see uh, if anything negative reports come out from there. But uh, Brees Hall uh, was a guy I thought really, really helped himself, Ben. And real quick, Fran, just to clean up my point, uh, Pierre Strong was at the Shrine Bowl. Christian yep, Watson, right. senior, bowl, senior just bowl, just cleaning that up. Yep. Yep. Uh, how about you, Dane? Uh, who's the guy that stood out to you? Uh, I'll go Sky Moore, uh, who I thought was already firmly in the day two conversation, and I thought he only helped himself running that four four one in the 40-yard dash. Uh, and then I thought he killed it on the position-specific drills, uh, especially the gauntlet. And no surprise there. I mean, he is a slant connoisseur, uh, you know, with the, the quick hits in that offense, the ability to pluck the ball away from his body without breaking stride, strong hands. Uh, it's also interesting. I did not expect this. He had the, the largest hands of any receiver at the combine this year, yep. uh, which is surprising for a guy that's not very big size wise. Um, so uh, Sky Moore, I thought just you know, look the the three cone and all that, that was okay. It wasn't great. wasn't terrible, but the straight line speed and just the way he uh, performed during the position uh, drills, I thought that's what really, really stood out for me and helped him. All right, well, let's get over to the, uh, the defensive side of the football. Same question, which defensive player helped himself most uh, with the workout? And I'm going to go with the guy that moves all the way up to Dan, I believe number three uh, in your mock draft, right? Trayvon Walker, yep. the pass rusher from Georgia. Uh, I was interested to see what he weighed in at. He came in at just on, over 270 pounds. Looks like he's going to be working uh, with that edge group, not with the interior lineman. Uh, 35 and a half inch arms, just a ridiculous wingspan. Uh, this, then he goes out and at 270, Runs a four five one, uh, posts a ridiculous three cone, a six eight nine three cone. Uh, again, at two hundred seventy plus pounds, uh, the rest of his testing was also pretty good, especially when you take size into account as well. So, to me, Trayvon Walker uh, looked outstanding in the positional drills, but the way he tested at that size, working with the edges, didn't look out of place. It wasn't like oh, like he's a big end, like he'd be better served inside. Like no, he he moved plenty well, uh, looked really really good, and, and so having uh, seeing him rise up. Uh, and everybody else's mock drafts, obviously, Dane, you've been so high on him uh, throughout the course of the process. So uh, not much of a change for you, but uh, it was good to see Trayvon Walker uh, just come out and kind of live up to that hype a little bit. Dane, who's a, a guy for you uh, on defense that really kind of helped himself? Yeah, what a freak, uh, uh, <laughs> Trayvon Walker. Can I just talk about him again during during my pick? Um, <laughs> so, no, I went with uh, Travis Jones from UConn, who – 
if not for Jordan Davis, who obviously had just a ridiculous workout, uh, you know, with his jumps and his 40 at uh, 341 pounds, if not for uh, Jordan Davis, we'd be talking so much more about Jones and what he did at 325 pounds running a 492, uh, 7333 cone. Uh, just really, really impressive from uh, from from Travis Jones and, and the position drills. His hoop drill was outstanding. So I, he's another guy that I think is on the move. Uh, he showed up in my first round mock. Uh, I put him to the Packers at the end of the round one. Uh, you know, we know a team that uh, you know never shies from you know up you know, getting some some big guys that can move on the defensive line. So uh, you know, I, I think there's a good chance he does sneak into round one now because there's only so many guys that are that size that can move like that and, and have the type of impact that uh, he could potentially have. So Travis Jones, I thought helped himself quite a bit. Yeah, he, he between the Senior Bowl and then Indianapolis, I thought he's he's really moved a lot better than I anticipated uh, after studying him on tape. But it's uh, really really impressive postseason here so far from Travis Jones. Ben, how about you? Who's a guy on defense that stood out over the course of the week? Yeah, Jones has some flashes that remind me a lot of like a Dexter Lawrence who had no problem going in the middle of the first round to the New York Giants out there. But two guys with a similar sentiment to my offensive guys just want to get the buzz going to players that aren't typically on your TVs on Saturday. And that's Tariq Wollin at UTSA and Zion McCollum, as Dane set up last segment, out of Sam Houston. Just two guys absolutely taking advantage of the stage the moment, the opportunity just to show out against maybe more eyeballs than they typically had. Now, I know the NFL guys all over it, but just for their collective buzz, the media scouts out there, Tariq Wollin, obviously one of the darlings of the week, height, weight, speed, freak show, not just a freak, freak show. and might be the poster child for the freak show uh, athletes out there this year in uh, Indy. With his times, his jumps, his fluidity, catching the football. You could see the former receiver skills and just how easy it is for him to pluck the ball away from his frame. He's an incredible prospect. And Zion McCollum, like Dane had mentioned, quietly a dominant workout and a very elite tester with really good size and speed as well. Just from two factories that maybe aren't typical, you know, uh, NFL you know, pipelines in Sam Houston State and UTSA. But I promise you, there's good players at both those programs. They're well coached, and these two need to be all over your boards. They are going to get drafted in the middle of the draft. I think it was especially big for McCollum because at least with Woolen, like he was on the freak list. He was pretty high up there over the course of the summer. So there was uh, there was some buzz that had built uh, about Tariq Woolen. I wouldn't say the same for Zion McCollum. And uh, look, a fifth year senior, he started all five years on campus to come out. And again, it's just all about uh, checking boxes and building momentum. A great kid off the field. Uh, he goes out, he's productive, longtime starter, high level experience. And he goes and has a great combine. That makes you feel really, really good about him uh, moving into the rest of the pre-draft process. All right, let's go now into some surprises. Guys that may have, uh, you know, just outperformed some expectations. I, I mentioned that with Travis Jones. You would mention that with Zion McCollum. Uh, for me, another guy I would say this, I'll go on the offensive side of the football, uh, Abe Lucas, the tackle from Washington State. Uh, and this is a guy, when you watch him, another really experienced player has, has played a ton of football uh, out there for the Cougars in two different systems. And to me, when I when I watched Abe Lucas, 6'6", he's a big, good-looking kid. He's got pretty good length. Um I didn't see the level of athlete that 492 in the 40, 725 in the three cone, 44 flat in the short shuttle. Just outstanding numbers uh, for the, the uh, redshirt senior that I didn't anticipate. Uh, and this is a guy that, again, has played a ton of football. He's played only right tackle over the course of his career. Um, to, I didn't see that level of athlete. And so uh, for me, uh, that was one of my big surprises. And, and it's a positive surprise, right? Because uh, now you get a guy that uh, you feel a little bit better about in terms of his movement skills moving into the NFL. So uh, Abe Lucas, uh, definitely a guy that stood out to me. Ben, I'll come to you next. Who, who's a guy that really stood out to you? You know, I'll say Kenneth Walker the third at Michigan State coming over from Wake Forest in 2021. Huge year. Um, but I did not see a 438 level of player on film. I was really surprised with how he tested in the 40. I thought he jumped fairly well as well. I thought he showed some pretty good uh, pass catching ability in the routes as well. He really showed off he's a more of a well-rounded player than I think the Michigan, tape, Michigan State tape suggested. I thought he was a little bit limited to be a kind of a between the tackles guy, get the dirty yards, but he's shown some juice and some burst to maybe get some perimeter angles on defenders and uh, maybe be more of a home run hitter than that frame and kind of size would suggest out there. So 438 at 5'9 to 11 is a really good time for Kenneth Walker. 
Yeah, I mentioned it before when we talked about him. That, that like his gait, like his his long strides, and just the way that his body's put together. He's a little bit smaller, but he reminds me of Leonard Fournette and the way that he builds. We know that Fournette uh, can scoot as well. He's a, a really interesting talent. Uh, obviously, uh, Heisman, Heisman finalist, one of the best running backs in the country this past year. Dane, how about you? Who's a guy that uh, that really kind of surprised you with the way that they worked out out in Indianapolis? I'm going to go with Kevin Austin, the Notre Dame receiver, uh, who uh, not a bad athlete by any means on tape, but for a guy that's 6'2", 200 pounds, I did not see the 4'4", speed or the 6'7", three cone, uh, 39-inch vert. Uh, like I saw a good athlete, but those numbers are the type of numbers that are really catching eyes uh, around the league. Uh, now, uh, he's a little bit of a complicated prospect because he was – you know, suspended for a whole year at Notre Dame and, you know, the character stuff that teams have got to get that figured out. But when you have that type of workout, you have that type of those type of numbers uh, athletically, you're going to get drafted. It's just a matter of, you know, a team finding a spot for you. Team's going to roll the dice and see what they have, uh, see if they can develop something. Because uh, when you when you're that type of athlete, you know, that kind of absolves a lot of your sins. So uh, Kevin Austin, that, that definitely surprised me. Uh, two different corners told me on Saturday that he was the most underrated receiver they faced last year. Chris Steele from USC, and I'm struggling to remember who the other one was, but both kind of referenced that that height, weight, speed combination. It's like, yeah, this guy uh, just kind of deserves more love. Just a really physically imposing receiver. Uh, we've talked. Did about you guys him. see that type of speed though? I, I, I mean, did, I, I did not see that kind of speed. And yeah, okay. to be honest, like the, the movement skills impressed me in the workout as well. I, I just thought he 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 had a really solid workout, uh, both catching the ball and uh, doing the testing. I mean, you had to look quick. He played a little over 800 snaps in yep. four years at Notre Dame. His career did not go as expected, really just a one-year player and kind of a rotational player at that. I know he started every game, but, um, yeah, he's, he's a guy that may have his best football ahead of him. He is a really impressive athlete that a little bit of a turbulent start to his career at Notre Dame and never got off the right foot with Brian Kelly. Well, like I said, there was the, the, the off-field stuff. That's yeah. – yeah. The teams are going to have to work through that uh, just to make sure that the type of guy they're getting. But yeah, when you're an athlete like that, that, that certainly helps. So for the next one, we're going to go with our, which workout sent us racing back to the film. Just a, uh, you know, first thing, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, uh, who was the first guy that you watched uh, based off what we saw in Indianapolis? Ben, I'll come to you first. Well, a lot of those guys I, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the FCS group of fives, the three Wollens of the world. You know, I went to watch Christian Watson again, but some of the offensive linemen really surprised me that I maybe didn't give enough attention to, or maybe I had a bad breakfast that day. But the first two on my list were Zach Tom out of Wake Forest with a really interesting left tackle center career out there. Don't forget, Kenneth Walker ran behind him for three years at Wake Forest and then went over to Michigan State. So had some prolific runs again. Uh, and Cam Jurgens out of Nebraska. I thought was one of the better looking offensive linemen in his field tests and his drills out there. Really fluid and athletic offensive lineman. He's a guy I really wanted to dig into a little bit further this week. So Cam Jurgens, Zach Tom, put me down for offensive lineman. Yeah, Zach Tom was actually mine uh, as well. And he's just a really impressive athlete. He tested really, really well uh, when you look at the workout. I mean, 6'4", uh, just over 300 pounds. He broke five flat in the 40, uh, 7'3'2 in the three cone, 4'4'7 in the short shuttle. Uh, went just short, just short of 120 inches uh, in the broad, 33 in the vert. I mean, just a ridiculous workout there from Zach Tom. And that athleticism does show up on film. He's got that initial quickness. Uh, you look at the change of direction, the burst, the lateral movement, the natural bend and flexibility, all of that is there. Uh, he's got the, be able, the feet to be able to play tackle. I do think that if you say, if you told me, Hey, like I really feel good that he could play tackle uh, despite shorter than ideal arm length. Like I, I can get with you on that. Um, I do think I like him a little bit more inside. I was really impressed with his independent hand usage, uh, really strong punch. He's got vice grips for hands, uh, really tough to be able to shed at the point of attack. I just, I really like Zach Tom. Uh, I think he's got, got the ability to be a, a starter in the NFL. And so to me, uh, that was a guy that I wanted to come back and just do a little bit more work on uh, after the trip to Indianapolis. Uh, uh, Dane, who would fit that list for you? Uh, no, those were good ones. Um, I, I would also add Bo Melton from Rockers, yep. uh, who, you know, we saw at the Senior Bowl. Yep. Um, and, and he's one of those guys that playing at Rutgers, it can, you don't always necessarily see the best uh, that he has to offer. Uh, you know, he played five years and he never had more than 700 yards receiving in any of those years. And he led the team in receiving three straight years. So uh, he just didn't have the type of, you know, if you, the type of production as if you went to Ohio State or one of these other schools. Um, but for him, you know, running a 4 3 4 40 yard dash, getting under seven seconds in the three cone, uh, the jumps were great. He had 38 inch vert. 
So uh, this is a two-year team captain. Uh, you know, he's the, 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 he had production, even though it wasn't doesn't necessarily jump off the page. Uh, but this is a player that uh, I went back and watched uh, a, a few more games, and I, I'm going to go back and watch even more until I kind of feel feel a little bit better about his eval. Yeah, Bill Melton's a great pick there, Dane. And I have a list as long as a page right here. That's what I'm doing all week of saying I didn't see that on tape or that really intrigued me. So just to empty out my notebook here, Jeremiah Moon out of Florida was a guy I want to dig further into. He tested like a freak show that nobody's talking about. Really interesting career at Florida. Had to put on the 2020 tape. Calvin Austin against Ahmad Gardner. They didn't play in 2021, put on 2020. Really interesting uh, film out there. And two corners that tested much better than I thought. Cam Taylor Britt, Nebraska, and Damari Mathis had a pit. Both flew. And I just want to take another look at their tape as well to see if maybe I didn't notice that speed the first time around. So one of the best exercises, as you guys know, taking what you saw at the combine, either com- confirming what you saw or going back and kind of having some uh, some new thoughts on players. So that's what the combine's all about. Not to solidify anything, but just to confirm what you saw before or to go back and maybe make some changes and restudy. So off that note, Ben, uh, I'm interested to kind of get your guys' thoughts just on, uh, you know, the players that maybe didn't test as well as people expected, but we're not all that worried about. We feel like we want to be able to trust the tape. Uh, no, and we talked about this in the lead up, right, with those uh, the combine previews on offense and defense guys you know, at each position that we weren't necessarily expecting to test well. Um, you know, like for me, like Traylon Burks uh, from Arkansas, like didn't run uh, as fast as everybody thought, didn't jump as bi- as far. Uh, the hands weren't as big as everyone thought, right, with the 5XL gloves or anything. But uh, to me, still leaning on what we know about Traylon Burks, what we've seen from him over the last couple of years down at Arkansas. Uh, I know he tested at the pro day today. He did. I, he didn't redo the 40. Uh, he redid the vert. No word on uh, on shuttle times yet from what I've seen. But uh, when you look at Traylon Burks, I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding with what we've seen from him over the course of his career at Arkansas. Uh, I would say the same thing about Roger McCreary, uh, who had a really good positional workout. Uh, the testing uh, portion was just okay. And he obviously came in uh, a little bit small as well, which we did expect. But I think when you look at Roger McCreary, uh, that's not one where I'm looking at like, oh man, like I'm, I'm really worried that he ran a four or five flat. Uh, that's not, that's going to really uh, affect my ability to, to, to view him projecting uh, to the NFL. Ben, are there a couple guys that kind of fit that bill for you where you're like, uh, I'm not going to get too, too worried based off what we saw from a testing standpoint? Yeah, too. I'll give you an offense, defense really quick off the top of my head. Kyler Gordon corner Washington played opposite Trent McDuffie all the rumors were Trent McDuffie was going to be a high 4-3 low 4-4 guy and he was saying Kyler Gordon beats him in a race easily however comes with a 40 Kyler Gordon 4-5-2 and actually had a buddy text me and said Gordon has no idea how to get out of his stance so he made it seem like it was a technique flaw in his 40 which is really interesting not all these players are used to the track technique of putting your hand down and firing out. There's a lot of kind of conversation about the translation of true track 40 yard times, but Kyler Gordon did not test as we expected. That's okay. His tape told me enough. His special teams told me enough. You could see the open end linear speed when he's running down as a punt gunner, easily running past Trent McDuffie on the other side. So keep that tape on his teach check and every box on the film. The other one, David Bell who tested 462, I believe, out of Purdue, put on his film. He knows how to separate, catches everything. When he isn't in that you know, separation mode, he can make the tough catches with a corner on his back or make adjustments along the sideline. I love his film. He's been productive for three years, prolific player out of high school, just not an elite tester, and that's okay. So I think in a couple of years, he'll be firmly in that bucket of four, five, five, four, six receivers that know how to win and know how to separate like, you know, the Devontae Adams and Allen Robinson's and all those low hanging fruits that we now go to now that didn't test in the four, four. So David Bell, Kyler Gordon, trust the tape. All right, Dane, how about you? Take us home. Uh, I'm going to go with a pair of top 10 picks who maybe didn't necessarily live up to um, expectations in certain drills. Uh, Kyle Hamilton from Notre Dame, uh, you know, didn't run the blazing four four forty that a lot of people thought he might do is you know low, or, uh, high four fives uh, or low four fives, um, and you know I thought you know we have to remember he's six four two twenty. This isn't a you know this is just a different type of guy. Um, and I, there wasn't a time on tape where I watched and I thought eh, I just wish he was faster. I mean he plays so much faster than that. And I think part of it is how smart he is and how he gets a head start. His anticipation that's part of it as well. And then the other one was Ikiakuanu, who uh, he ran well in the 40. He was, he was in the four nines, 
But his, I thought his three cone was a little disappointing at 782, his short shuttle 473. I thought he'd be a little bit better in, in those two drills, uh, just with the the you know movements in the short area. Um, but I'm not I'm not worried about those two. I still think, you know, leaving the combine, if moves in the mix to be the number one overall pick and, and a team that drafts him is gonna be very lucky to have him. Well, guys, we are going to uh, keep this show going here with our next segment. It's time to uh, pick three random teams or three random players for three random teams. It's now time to go on the clock. On the clock. All right, guys. Well, like I said, it's time now to go on the clock. And uh, we haven't done this for a couple of weeks. So just as a refresher for any new listeners, uh, basically what we do is we go to uh, one of those randomizers where I could just put in a list of teams, a list of positions, and a list of parts of the draft and say, okay, each of us are going to get assigned a certain assignment for uh, picking a random player for a random team in a random position. So, uh, Dane, for instance, you have wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills in round one. And so we'll kind of talk through what are some of the things that the Bills look for, some of the things that they've done under Brandon Bean and with this coaching staff. Obviously, a new offensive coordinator there in Brian Dable. But uh, I gave this assignment to you yesterday, so I'm excited to hear kind of what you th- what you thought based off the research that you've done. Yeah, and it, it's just a, 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 as an aside um, – a lot of Bills fans were not happy when I gave them an offensive lineman in the first <laughs> round of my mock draft. Uh, and it's funny if you talk to Bills fans in December, they would have loved that. And now it's, they're very much anti offensive line um, at that point in the draft. But, you know, I think if, if they're going to go, if you're looking at wide receiver in the first round, obviously it depends on, you know, who's there and uh, it could they're, they're picking in the later portion of the first, uh, but does, does Traylon Burks get there? And I think that when you look at which Traylon Burks could be, He's different than Cole Beasley, um, but maybe serving as that big slot instead of, you know, Cole Beasley is a different type of player uh, size wise and how he wins. But Traylon Burks can be that big slot. He just kind of he just looks a little bit different. And so it, it may be a little bit of a pivot compared to what they've had in the past. But I think that with what Burks offers and what they could be potentially looking for when you've got Stefan Diggs and Gabe Davis on the outside, you plug in uh, a Traylon Burks as that big slot receiver uh, who can do a lot of different things for you. Um, I, I think there's some there, there's there could be a possible fit there. Um, and just looking at you know at the Bills, you know I can't go wrong with the the SEC taking the top talent from that that conference. Um, and I think that's it. based off of who could be there and what could potentially fit that offense. Burks makes some sense. You know, I really like that pick, Dane, because they're going to be looking to fill that slot receiver role with Isaiah McKenzie as a free agent. They gave Cole Beasley uh, the blessing to seek a trade. So this is a new age slot gadget player. So it's a complete upgrade and a completely different package, but can probably be used the same. Remember, Isaiah McKenzie lined up in the backfield, got some handoffs, trailing Burks, did that out in Arkansas, just in a 30 pound, maybe even a 40 pound heavier package than what they had but he's got the body armor to do it. And he's probably got some more availability for that offense. I would love to see him paired with Stefan Diggs and Devin Singletary and uh, be at Josh Allen's disposal. Yeah, and I'd love it for him too, because he wouldn't be asked to be the number one guy, you know, exactly. he yep. you know, you know, he's not going to be asked to be a thousand yard receiver as a, as a rookie. Um, he'd be able to come in and, you know, contribute and just kind of grow as a receiver because he needs it. He, he's not a necessarily, you know, plug and play going to be a, in a, you know, that Jamar Chase type of wide receiver. He's just, he, he's not at that level right now, but talent wise uh, it's all there. And I just looking at some of the players they've taken high over the you know first day or you know round one or day two, uh, you know, athletic profile, not super, super important. Uh, they love big guys. They love tough guys. They love productive guys. Like, uh, so I think you, you check a lot of the boxes there uh, with Traylon Burks. And if he were to fall, that wouldn't be a, a huge surprise uh, if they decided to go that route for everything that you mentioned. Uh, so for me, when I, when I drew these yesterday, um, cornerback for the Baltimore Ravens, and day two. So I'm like, all right, let me look back. They're, they're day two picks. Uh, right now, second round, 45th overall, third round, 76th overall. So somewhere, uh, you know, in that in that range, so I'm looking at different players. And just looking at some of the staples we've seen with Eric DaCosta since he's taken over as the general manager and as the main primary decision maker for the Baltimore Ravens, definitely more of a trend toward big schools. 23 of 26 picks have come from the Power Five. Uh, lack of experience does not scare them. Uh, size definitely matters. Youth definitely matters. And they're not afraid of bad testers. So to me, it came down to 
uh, a handful of different names and for different reasons, right? So uh, Jalen Armour, Armour Davis from uh, from Alabama, and we know that uh, Ozzie Newsom's still in that building. He's got the office, I'm pretty sure, right next to Eric DaCosta, and we know those Alabama ties. Uh, so that lack of experience, I don't think that would scare them away from Jalen Armour Davis, a player that can, can play a lot of man coverage, uh, which they like to do out there in Baltimore. Kair Elam uh, from Florida, uh, a guy that, you know, not necessarily afraid of the guys that don't test super, super well. They like bigger corners. Uh, Elam makes sense. Now, his uncle Matt was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens a few years ago, and everybody, basically, everybody's still there uh, that drafted. I don't know if that helps them or hurts them, but it, kind of an interesting anecdote there with Kyir Elam. Uh, Kyler Gordon, I think, matters for a lot of the reasons, Ben, uh, that you mentioned. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then Roger McCreary as well. If he were to fall to the second round, to 45th overall, early second round, um, that wouldn't, I don't think, that, that wouldn't scare them away uh, as well either. So to me, I'm looking across the board, and not any of these players like matches every single one of these boxes. But I ended up settling on McCreary, and we'll see if you know if, if McCreary does fall a little bit uh, due to the lack of that height, weight, speed fa- uh, factor. Uh, that would be a guy that I would watch there uh, early second round for the Baltimore Ravens. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts there, but uh, it was it was interesting kind of going through. Okay, what are the the, the corners that kind of fit uh, some of these boxes for them? Do you, do you, are you considering McCreary an inside or outside guy to play both spots? I do think he can play both for sure. And he, okay. he has done a little bit of that uh, at Auburn, but I do like him more, or I do like his ability to be that kind of flexible uh, piece there in the back end. All right. So with that in mind, uh, Ben, we'll now go to the third one here. And you actually drew uh, the Denver Broncos in round three and a Y okay. tight end. It was very specific Y tight end. So uh, a guy that can play in line. Uh, obviously, this is important, too, because they, they reportedly in that trade with Russell Wilson, Noah Fan uh, moving on. So uh, they have Albert Okwebuna, who is definitely more of that pass, ke- pass, pass catching option. Uh, so there are some reps to be had there at the tight end position uh, with the Denver Broncos. So I just to kind of get your thoughts, mm-hmm. uh, having had 24 hours to kind of sit on this a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts there for the Broncos? All right, Broncos, Y tight end, round three. Okay, just looking at the trade compensation here. We do still have our round three pick here, so relax everyone saying, do we even have a round three? 96 overall from the Rams. Sounds like that was in the Von Miller package last year, if I'm just guessing. Fan off to Seattle, Albert O is there, Eric Saubert behind the scenes. Don't forget, new GM, George Patton, now uh, over there running the show next to Elway. Came over from Minnesota from 2007 to 2020. He was there for a long time. New head coach, too. So Nathaniel Hackett uh, coming over from Green Bay. Just trying to get a perspective of what he likes out of the wide tight end. Who they have there? Mercedes Lewis. He also had Mercedes Lewis back in Jacksonville. So he's okay with kind of a blocking tight end that maybe isn't the sexiest pass catching option out there. You know, I think this is going to be a really good ballpark for a Y-10. And I think the Trey McBride and Greg Dulcich are going to be off the board at this point in round three. I think those are the first two off. So we're okay. looking at, you know, is it the Jalen Weidermeyer at Texas A&M? Jelani Woods, I think, is working his way into a back end of day two conversation. But the guys I'm eyeing up are Kate Otten out of Washington and Jeremy Ruckert out of Ohio State, who I think are both excellent two-way tight ends that – uh, probably give you a little bit more in the run game than they would as upside pass catchers. But I think Ohio State's Jeremy Ruckert's best football is ahead of him. He's a guy that reminded me a little bit of like a Nick Vanette coming out of Ohio State, who I think actually spent some time with the Broncos in his career as well. So I'm just picturing and connecting dots there. And I think that Ohio State to Denver transition is going to work out well. So Jeremy Ruckert, third round pick, 96th overall to the Denver Broncos. I like that fit there. George Payton actually uh, last year in his first year as general manager uh, took two Buckeyes. They took Baron Browning in the third round and they took uh, Jonathan Cooper, Jonathan Cooper. Uh, late in the round, right, uh, late yeah. in the draft. So uh, two Buckeyes already uh, in tow for them. So uh, why not go back to that? Well, I, I like that. I think it makes a lot of sense for all the reasons you laid out, Ben. Uh, yeah, just kind of a fun exercise. Just kind of talking through it again. The purpose of the exercise is to have an understanding that not every team is going to like every single player. Everybody has uh, different things that they like, uh, different trends that they typically fall into. Obviously, scheme uh, plays a big part in it as well. So always a fun exercise to do uh, each and every week. Uh, guys, uh, great stuff. As always, we will talk to you both uh, next week right here on the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the Draft Mailbag. 
All right, so great stuff there from both Ben and Dane. And again, the best way to reach us, the best way to throw us your support is to go on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever you listen, leave us a rating, leave us a question, we'll answer it. If you've got a mock draft, we'll break it down, big board rankings. It could be about uh, the process. It could be about a specific player. Whatever it is that you want, we will answer it here on an upcoming episode. And we've got a bunch that we're going to get to uh, here in this episode. And we're going to start things off with Shane SS 91 who left a five-star review saying, love the podcast friend lucky to be an eagles fan where we have such great podcasts all year round question whenever i play with a mock draft simulator i always tend to grab the same combination of wide receiver linebacker corner and defensive end with those three first round picks of those four positions which would you recommend waiting until round two for i guess i wonder which of those four has the greatest talent drop off from round one to two uh, you could maybe make, get a, a john mechie or a george pickens in the second round but are there corners that are close to trent mcduffie or ahmad Gardner? down there. Same for edge and linebacker. Thanks. So Shane, it's a really good question and it's really interesting based off of, uh, you know, every team might approach that a little bit differently. I would say that, you know, the common wisdom would say that the three impact positions in that and those four are wide receiver, corner, and pass rusher as opposed to linebacker. But the reason why I would couch that, I would say uh, it may not always flow that way. Uh, number one, you have to remember, and this is the, we try and always hammer this home whenever possible, is that it's not just about how players perform on the field. You have to remember uh, that fit means multiple things. Does the guy fit our scheme? Does the guy fit what we look for in terms of body type? Does the guy fit what we need from a medical standpoint? Does the guy fit what we're looking for in our locker room? Does he fit what we need in our depth chart because of who we already have in that room, right? So there are lots of, when we talk about fit, there are a lot of definitions of that. And so, uh, number one, you have to keep that in mind. And that's one of the things that, you know, insert name here as a guy that uh, is seen as a first round pick, a lock first round pick in every mock draft. Well, a team may look at that and say, well, this guy's not a, a great fit for us. He's not a great fit for whatever reason, for all those reasons, all those different factors and more uh, you know, that I brought up. So I think when you look at uh, all of these positions, yeah, like you or I may look at it and say, oh, this guy's a great fit for my team or a great fit for this team if you're doing a mock draft. But you have to remember, and that's one of the reasons why we do the, uh, the on-the-clock segment is to just kind of bring those discussions to the forefront uh, and say and just clarify that teams are looking at different things depending on where they are, not just in the team building, process, but where they are uh, in terms of uh, schematically and in terms of the things that they put uh, a lot of emphasis on during the team building process. So uh, for me, I would say that most people would say that you wait for the linebacker, but let's say you're in the first round and let's say the receiver, the receivers, the corners, and the pass rushers are off the board, and you know the, you don't view anybody else as being uh, that kind of a player, and you have a linebacker, and there's a drop-off after him. Well, that's when you say, all right, well, we're going to go ahead uh, and put this card in with the linebacker on it, right? And so it's a tough one to answer, Shane, and I'm not backing out of the question. I just want to say why it's a difficult one uh, to answer. But I would say conventional wisdom would point to waiting on the linebacker, but you know, the, every team is going to approach that differently. And you have, you have no idea, I have no idea how any team, much less the Eagles, how any team uh, feels about uh, that discussion. It's always an interesting one to have, though, when you talk about positional value. Let's go to the next one here. Wool Unpulled left a five-star review saying, Excellent and crisp paced podcast. Uh, projecting a bit ahead here, what teams might be in the mix to trade up with one of the Eagles' first round picks? I like a lot of this draft pool on defense, and I want Howie Roseman to have a bunch of darts. There's a lot to like through the early third round on defense. You can wait until the fourth or fifth round on running backs, receivers, and tight ends. I really feel like the Eagles should move some of their current offensive linemen on the roster as well for some mid round picks. I love the current O line depth, but let Jeff Statlin have a couple more young picks for the offensive line. And so, uh, Wool unpulled obviously a handful full of things to, to address there in terms of the uh, the trade, right? So the, for finding somebody to trade up, uh, you know, to take one of these Eagles picks, so the Eagles can move back. Well, that's the that's the crux of it, right? Is trying to find somebody who is willing to make that trade. Now, those discussions, if they haven't started yet, if they didn't start out in Indianapolis, they will start here in the coming weeks. All 32 teams, they're going to talk with the other 31 teams and say, okay, just trying to gauge your feel. Are you willing to move up? Are you willing to move back? Uh, do, is there anything you're looking for? Are you locked into staying put? Uh, you know, are you looking on offense? Are you looking on defense? Any information you can kind of glean, you're trying to try. You're going to try and get that information uh, at this time, and then as things get closer and closer and closer to the draft, some more of those dis those discussions can start getting locked in and say, hey, if we if we uh, if our player that we like is on the clock with you. And as you bring it up at 15 or 16 or 19, 
what would it take for us to move up? Are we talking uh, a second round pick? Is it a, a second and a third? Is it next year's first? What you know? Let's let's have those conversations. And so uh, a lot of those deals they get made in the weeks leading up to the draft. Uh, and so that, again, all 32 teams they're going to do their due diligence there uh, in terms of trying to find out that information in the build up to that part of the process. Uh, you also mentioned uh, just having a bunch of darts and, and you really liking the the receivers and the the running backs and tight ends in the middle of rounds. Uh, I wanted to really quickly adjust the idea of. Of, hey, we've got some depth on the roster. We've got some veterans that we like uh, as depth, but we're going to trade them for draft picks to acquire more depth. Uh, that can be easier said than done sometimes. And that's all I wanted to kind of say is that uh, it's not always easy to say, okay, well, we have a guy that we really like as a swing tackle or as a swing backup or a, a backup linebacker. So we're going to trade this, uh, trade that player for a pick that we hope then can become that player. Uh, depending on where you are in the team building process, you know that maybe that makes sense, but again, it might be easier said than done. So just something something to keep in mind there. Uh, good question there from Wool Unpulled. Thanks so much for the five star review. Uh, two more here. I want to make sure we get to David H zero four one three left a five star review saying, "Been listening to every podcast revolving around the draft for the Eagles. I hope they go after offensive lineman Kenyon Green, a pass rusher like Jermaine Johnson, George Karlaftis, or Trayvon Walker, and or a linebacker or corner. Eagles need to address the defense with these picks if they keep all three. So real quick before we get to the rest." the question wanted to address those three players Kenyon Green Texas a and he played all four off or four of the five offensive line positions this year as a junior he's played a couple different spots over the course of his career he started at guard both guard spots he's gotten some starts at tackle when you look at Green athletic he's really physical he's got some things to clean up from a, a technique standpoint but you love the versatility you love the athleticism you love the competitive nature so I like a lot a lot to like there with Kenyon Green who was a five-star recruit one of the top linemen in the country started right away for the Aggies down there in College Station. Uh, you talked about the pass rushers, Jermaine Johnson, Carl Aftis, and Trayvon Walker. It seems to me that, you know, based off mock drafts, that Johnson and Walker may have played themselves uh, and may have performed in the pre-draft process to a level where they are now out of range for the Eagles at 15, right? Where uh, Jermaine Johnson, uh, with what he did at the Senior Bowl, certainly at the Combine, Trayvon Walker doing what he's done at the Combine, measuring in the way he did and testing the way he did, as we talked about earlier. Uh, I mean, Dane had him at number three uh, in his latest mock draft. George Karlaftis, you're seeing in some mock drafts fall to the Eagles. It's not out of the possibility, though, that all three of those guys are off the board. So just something to keep in mind with those three pass rushers. And then you mentioned linebacker corner. Let's get to the rest of this question. Uh, the This is a loaded defensive draft. Eagles have holes at all three levels. They also need a bona fide slot receiver as well. Good receivers can be had in later rounds, and I love Kyle Phillips. Uh, he is the slot receiver from UCLA. Uh, just qu- for me, quick aside on Kyle Phillips. He was a junior who declared early for the draft, but since he had his degree, he was eligible to play in the East-West Shrine Bowl out in Las Vegas. So he goes out there, was reportedly one of the best players in attendance. Everybody loved uh, his performance down there in Las Vegas. He goes to the combine. I thought he had a rock solid workout uh, out in Indianapolis. Uh, I caught up with him, talked with him for a little bit. Uh, seemed like a nice kid, obviously a, a really productive player over the course of his career, both as a receiver and as a punt returner. So he offers that flexibility and that level of juice uh, to special teams. So uh, Kyle Phillips, good name there for day three. Uh, and then the last person that uh, David brought up, Hassan Haskins. He said Hassan Haskins as a power option would be nice. So many holes in this team this year. They need to draft best player available. I would say that the Eagles in in, uh, in the past recent history, they have drafted best player available. This is a team that is always looking for value. Uh, you know, and it's not as easy as saying, "Oh, this is," because uh, you know, people will say like, "Oh, the the need." always trying to uh, address his best player available. It's not always as easy as, all right, who's the best player on the board? Take him. All right, who's the best player on the board? Take him. I don't think any team really operates that way. I don't think that's reality, but you're also trying, you're always trying to address what's a, a position of need with a great value on the board, and you try and match those two uh, things together. So um, good question there from David H. Now, last one here. Alex in Phoenix left a five-star review saying, love the podcast, great content for the birds and nationally. Any chance they look at a running back in the second round? Here is my mock draft using the draft network. Thanks. So let's just break this draft up into uh, thirds. All right. So we'll go first round. George Karlaftis, Devontae Wyatt, Drake London. We talked about Karlaftis a little bit earlier. I believe it was the last question. Uh, Karlaftis, powerful, uh, high effort edge rusher, uh, came in as a true freshman, had a huge impact, a little bit slowed last year with injury and with COVID-19, but came back in 2021 and was really disruptive. And you saw that ability to be an impact rusher off the edge. So George Karlaftis there at 15. Devontae Wyatt, off the top of my head, 
I believe he only had five sacks in his career. He had two and a half this year, fifth year senior, went back for that extra year uh, and really helped himself. And now is in the discussion to be the first defensive tackle off the board. Uh, highly athletic. He's a really engaging personality. Talked with him for a little bit uh, out in Indianapolis, a fun player to talk to really all those Georgia kids were. Uh, but why really impressive from that standpoint and also really athletic. I mean, he broke four, seven, six, I believe in the 40 yard dash. Uh, he tested really well in, in other areas. He looked good in the positional workout. He had a good senior bowl, was one of the best defensive linemen in terms of one-on-ones down there in Mobile. So you, you, he's a player that you might be able to say, hey, he might be more productive in the pros than what he was in Georgia, considering what he was asked to do as more of a uh, kind of a point of attack player in that system. If you're just asking him to kind of cut it loose and get into the backfield, he's got that flexibility to be able to do that as well. So uh, Devontae Wyatt, intriguing player there at number 16. And then number 19, Drake London uh, from USC. If you don't know already, I mean, Drake London, 6'3", 210 pounds roughly, uh, really good playing above the rim. He was a basketball player. Player, uh, at USC, so you see that skill set uh, translates to the football field. Uh, he is definitely a, a big body threat that isn't going to thrive on uh, quickness and separation from that standpoint, but uh, you know made a living on those contested catches and creating yards after catch and getting him the ball on the run. He worked in the slot previously to this year, and then uh, this past season as a junior moved outside, uh, took over Amon Ross St. Brown's previous role. Uh, it's also the same role that Michael Pittman played in that offense. So the far left of the formation that in theory, that in, in history, has been the, the number one receiver in that offense uh, out there at USC over the last couple of years in that system. So uh, when you look at Drake London, really, really productive, broke his ankle uh, midway through the season, late October, so couldn't participate in the combine, uh, set to have a private workout with teams uh, after USC's pro day, but before the draft, I think early April is the target date there for Drake London. Uh, the rest of this draft, day two, Isaiah Spiller, the running back from Texas A&M, and Georgia linebacker Quay Walker. Isaiah Spiller, Another guy from AM that was a big time recruit came in, started right away as a freshman, uh, productive, kind of a versatile back in that he can check a lot of boxes. He's not a dynamic athlete, but I think he does enough for you on third down that you would say he can be a three down back. He's proven to be a foundation option in the backfield, really good vision and patience. He can make people miss. So you just char- start checking a lot of boxes with Spiller. Even though he's not that dynamic athlete, he can do a lot for you in the backfield. Some people thought uh, he could be a future first round pick. I don't know if that's going to necessarily happen, but uh, Spiller is a, is a good player. And I think it makes sense to get to your question you asked there. Uh, could the Eagles look at running back in the second round? I wouldn't rule out any position uh, for the Eagles. Look, they've got two players that are set to hit free agency uh, with Jordan Howard and Boston Scott. You've got another in Miles Sanders who's set to hit the free agent market a year from now. So you wouldn't rule out uh, any position. And certainly uh, I put running back in that list when you get into this draft. And then Quay Walker, uh, height, weight, speed player at Georgia, uh, 6'3", uh, you know, he's in that 235, 240 pound range, uh, runs really well, especially on film. This is a guy that has sideline the sideline range. He plays through contact. He can rush the passer. He was a pass rusher uh, coming out of high school and had to learn how to play as an off-ball linebacker. So he comes in, plays a ton of special teams, didn't really play as a starter until this year. And so there are times where he's a little bit slow to see things, a little bit slow to trigger, and you, know, you, know, you question the instincts. Uh, but this is a guy, again, who's relatively still new to the position, very similar to Micah Parsons. When he was in high school, he was a pass rusher in high school. Quay Walker had to make that same transition. Uh, so you see him match up the tight ends in space sometimes. You see him rush the passer. Uh, he's got a lot of a lot of versatility uh, to his game and a really intriguing height, weight, speed profile. So Quay Walker, a really fun player there for the University of Georgia. Four guys here on day three. I'll buzz through them fast. Martin Emerson in the fourth round. Corner, Mississippi State. Big, instinctive ball skills. Uh, you have your question, is he going to be able to play man coverage in the NFL? Uh, but I think when you look at those three checks, Size, instincts, ball skills, that carries you uh, as a corner. Nick Cross, the safety from Maryland, uh, he tested really well. He's a little bit sawed off athletically or from a size standpoint. He's not the biggest, but I think when you look at uh, how thick he is, I mean, he is a physically imposing safety when you get up on him, and he tested well, like I said, was productive. He'll come down and hit you, but he also had, I think, five picks this year. Um, so cross an intriguing option at the safety spot. And then two senior bowlers to round it out, Cole Strange and Haskell Garrett. Cole Strange is an offensive lineman from Tennessee Chattanooga, athletic, really tough and competitive. He's a really good finisher on tape. Uh, He'll get after you in the run game, but also uh, in the pass game, he is not so passive. He will get after you in every phase. He goes to the combine test really well, so checking a lot of boxes there on Cole Strange. And then Haskell Garrett, probably one of the better three techniques, pure three techniques in this class. He's undersized, but he can disrupt. He's got a quick first step. He's athletic. He's never on the ground. Uh, Inconsistencies in the run game probably keep him into that more mid-round range, but I would say both those guys, Strange and Garrett, would be viewed as, uh, as big 
getting steals by most people if they were to fall to the sixth round. So uh, Alex, really good value there uh, with a bunch of these guys, to be honest. I, I think he did a nice job uh, in this mock draft. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to Alex. Thanks to David. Thanks to Wool Unpulled. And, and then lastly, thanks to Shane uh, for your questions. We hit four of them here on this episode. We'll get to more next week here uh, on the show, which, by the way, for next Tuesday's episode, we're going to record next Monday. Uh, myself, Dane, Ben, we're going to break down the offensive line class. We're going to do a full preview on the offensive line here in this 2022 NFL Draft. Don't miss it right here on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand.